where a beautiful independent woman fell prey to one of the most narcissistic and psychopathic individuals I have ever come across. November 9th, 2023, at 40 minutes past midnight, Aitbek Amangeldi receives a text from his sister, Saltanat Nukinova. I am leaving Kwandik, her husband. I'm taking a taxi and coming over now. This is not the first time. It's closer to the 12th that she has tried to leave him. One day in September, she returned home from work to find woman's lipstick, foundation, eyelashes, all over her bedsheets. The room smelled of sex, and there were two used condoms in the toilet. This was supposed to be the final straw. Her family were supportive. They welcomed her back and were even arranging a place for her. But to their shock, she renewed her wedding vows the next month, on October 26th, in a ritual aligned to the Kazakh culture, called the Nika. Her husband had won her over again with his words, no doubt by asking for forgiveness and pledging to change. Once again, this time for good, Aitbek texts her back, come over, I'm waiting. However, this is the last correspondence he'll ever have with his sister. That very day at 8 p.m., emergency services responded to a call at an upscale restaurant, Bao located in Kazakhstan's capital city, Astana. Reportedly, there was a quarrel between some visitors, which resulted in a woman succumbing to her injuries. The Bao restaurant is located in Gastro Center, the building owned by Kwandik's extended family, in arguably the most affluent part of the city, right next to the Ritz-Carlton and across the road from government offices, where prominent businessmen and officials often come to wine and dine. Upon their arrival, police are greeted by Kwandik Bishimbaev. He explains that he had an argument with his wife that night, wherein things got heated between them. She tripped and hit her head on the toilet, resulting in bruising. He removed the clumps of hair from her head, placed them on the table, and laid her down to rest. He slept besides her, but after he woke up from his sleep, she continued to snore. A few hours later, despite attempts to revive her with the help of his cousin, they were unsuccessful. She remained unresponsive, and they decided to call for help. Heading to the VIP room, the police saw a mess. Clothes were hanging off the furniture, the floor was littered with items, the table had glasses and empty wine bottles, along with a broken watch, jewelry, clips of hair, and a red-stained napkin. The adjacent curtains had brown and red stains on it, but what caught their attention was the restroom. The door had a hole through it, and there were visibly broken tiles inside, with some blood as well. Clear signs that some degree of violence had transpired before their arrival. On the sofa lay a woman wrapped in a blanket. Walking closer as she came into focus, it was clear that her face was barely recognizable, extremely bruised, red and swollen. Her body was cold to touch, she had no pulse, and she had been gone for quite some time. There was nothing police or paramedics could do to save her. The woman was identified as Sultana Nukanova, the 31-year-old wife of Kwandaik Bishimbaev. At the scene was also Kwandaik's cousin, Baktizan Bezanov, the director of the gastro center, the building where the restaurant is located. Both men were questioned by the police. Kwandaik was well known. In 2016, he was Minister of National Economy and just six months into his office, he was accused of accepting bribes. He was compelled to resign and was convicted of the crime in March 2018. While he was sentenced to 10 years in prison, he was released a year and a half later and officially pardoned soon thereafter. However, in his civilian life, he lived a life of luxury, being a shareholder in the family's businesses. His father was a prominent political figure, which afforded him a life of luxury and he was groomed from a young age to hold politically powerful positions in the government, to serve and lead his country. However, the actions that would come to light would soon prove just how far the apple has fallen from the tree. After brief questioning at the scene, both men were arrested. The post-mortem report would later reveal that Nukanova suffered 13 blows to the head alone, caused by blunt force trauma. Her entire face was covered in multiple bruises, cuts, and abrasions. 
She suffered severe head injury and her nose was shattered into pieces. The left side of her face, especially, had multiple wounds, which continued down and around her chin. She suffered from subdural hematoma, which is when blood collects between the skull and the surface of the brain. In her case, she had 230 ml, or a glass full of blood that had collected. Left untreated, this causes brain herniation, or areas of the brain that are moved around their original position due to the pressure and swelling. Her death was due to vital life-sustaining functions of the central nervous system being disrupted, such as her breathing and her heart. Beyond this, she had marks and signs of strangulation. The toxicology report determined there were no drugs or medication in her blood, and only low levels of alcohol was present. To unravel what led to this tragedy, we must first go back to where it all began. Sultanat Nukanova was born into a respected family in Kazakhstan in 1992. Her grandfather, an honored teacher, had a judo tournament organized in his memory. Her father built a successful business and her uncle Kairat had a respectable political career as a governor. Her family loved and supported her and her brother equally. They covered her education expenses when she wanted to go to England for her university studies. During this time, she developed an interest in psychology, astrology, and meditation. After a brief tenure in the banking industry, she decided to quit her job and forge a new career in these topics that interested her. Sultanat took several courses in astrology and started conducting personal consultations. She quickly became a popular astrologer, with people booking consultations with her weeks in advance. Her charismatic appeal and adeptness at weaving psychology sessions with community events by also inviting others in her field skyrocketed her popularity in the industry. She would exclusively see women or couples, but never men alone. Financially, she was successful and could independently support herself, and her brother said she never once asked her family for money. Her future plans included becoming a TV presenter and a YouTube personality, ambitions that her family wholeheartedly believed she would be successful in. Her brother, Aitbeck, said she was not just an astrologer, but went out of the way to help people out of troubling situations in their life, such as one occasion where they helped a friend escape from her abusive husband. This had occurred over 10 years in the past, before her career had even begun. The irony of this situation is that she was able to help others escape, but not herself. Sultanat, being the young and attractive woman, caught the attention of Kwandaik Bishambayev through her Instagram account, which was shown to him by a mutual friend. Despite his interest, Sultanat's assistant turned down his appointment request as she didn't conduct sessions for men. A woman named Camilla, who claimed to be coming with a man, managed to book a session. However, she arrived alone and revealed that a mutual friend, a man wanted to meet Sultanat. During their conversation, Camilla obtained Sultanat's personal number, which she shared with Pishimbayev. From around May 2022, Pishimbayev started sending Sultanat poems and insisted on meeting her. Sultanat, who was more interested in helping her female clients than dating, refused his advances for over a month. However, in June, she ended a three-year relationship with her boyfriend. She was not ready for a new relationship and simply wanted to focus on her work, studies, and astrology courses. Bishambayev, however, managed to find Sultanat at her favorite establishment one morning. He walked up to her, introduced himself, said he happened to be driving past and saw her through the window. He struck up a conversation about psychology and their courtship began from there. A few months later, Bishambayev invited Sultanat to a concert by Valerie Meldazi and in October that same year, they visited a friend in Baku, the capital city of Azerbaijan together. After this trip together, it seems after months of pursuit, Pishimbayev finally won the heart of Sultanat. Upon her return, she spoke fondly of Pishimbayev and expressed the desire to help him with his difficult family relationships. Her brother summarized that she fell in love and idolized this man. But who exactly is Kwandik Bishambayev, the then 43-year-old mystery man with a complicated past, to say the least? Other than his failed political career mentioned earlier, 
Vishenbaev was raised around a life of luxury. He attended the Ivy League George Washington University and had a fast-track political career, holding several positions as an advisor and a VP before being promoted to Minister of Economy in 2016. After his career came crashing down in just six months, he was able to recover within two years and continued his life of luxury thanks to the income he'd received from being a shareholder in the various family-owned businesses. He was previously married for 14 years and had four children, but during the time of courtship, he was reportedly single and adamant on pursuing Sultanat. Within the same year, on December 2022, Sultanat and Bishambayev decided to get married. Despite her parents' reservations about her marrying a man who had been married before, had four children, but most glaringly, a fraud conviction, they accepted her decision. The couple organized a Kazakh wedding ceremony known as Nika. Due to some outdated database information on Bishambayev, they weren't officially married on the register, but went through with the religious ceremony and Sultanat was recognized as his de facto wife after the ceremony. Less than a month from the wedding, after New Year's 2023, Sultanat began experiencing physical violence. She didn't share much about this with anyone, but her brother Aitbek realized she was in trouble. In February, the couple went on honeymoon to Maldives. During this time, Aitbek had a lengthy conversation with his sister, urging her to leave her husband. To reassure him, Sultanat sent photos showcasing their happiness together. Aitbek detested her husband and refused to open these photos because he didn't want to see Bishambayev's face. These photos were later used by Bishambayev's defense as evidence they were happy and to disregard his abusive behavior at the time. Ironically though, Sultanat's lawyers pointed out visible signs of beatings on her body in these photos. On the night of March 20th, 2023, Sultanat sent her brother two photos showing signs of physical abuse and asked him to keep them. She feared that her husband, who had full access to her iPhone, would delete them. Upon seeing the photos, her brother confronted Bishambayev, leading to a fight. Following the fight, Sultanat was seen less frequently by everyone, as her husband forbade her from seeing her friends and family. She did communicate they would often fight, but didn't disclose the details with anyone. It wasn't until after her death that her family and friends truly started to piece together and grasp the extent of the abuse she had suffered those few months. Pishambayev was a controlling husband. He forbade Sultanat from working. She had to cancel all her sessions, which stumped her booming career, and she became financially dependent on him. She was also restricted from meeting her friends, which severely limited her social life. When her brother suggested she leave her husband, she asked if her brother could provide for her until she could get back on her feet. She also told her brother that Bishambayev also demanded to keep a nude video of her as collateral in case she ever left him. He would release it to the public, ruining her reputation. She mentioned this to a friend, that she was perpetually stuck in a hopeless situation, with a constant shadow of physical violence and living in a state of fear and consequences. After Sultanat's murder, it was confirmed in court that her husband had demanded she record a nude video to ensure she wouldn't blackmail him with all the photos of her beatings. He later used this video to control her. In a state of fear and facing physical violence, Sultanat felt she had no choice but to comply. She described her situation as hopeless in a message to a friend. Her last night alive. On November 8th, 2023, Sultana was given tickets to a concert of a popular Russian singer, Dima Bilan, by a friend. Her husband is a huge fan of his, and she accepted two free tickets to go with her friend and bring her husband along. Sometime during that concert, a woman approached them and kissed her husband on the cheeks. Reportedly, this sparked an argument between them, considering her husband's history of infidelity. They left the concert early and went to the Bao restaurant. CCTV can see them walking in and out of the restaurant and talking at several occasions at the entrance to the building below. Reportedly, the argument persisted because Bishambayev, who also accused his wife of hanging on to her past relationships, and she had reportedly had enough. Over the course of the night, they had several physical altercations, 
many of them off camera, but bruises on Sultanat's face show evidence of fresh wounds she didn't have earlier when they went to the concert. At some point, she called her brother and told him she was leaving her husband, but never left. Mishinbayev admitted in court she told him she wanted to leave. He said he reasoned with her to sleep on her decision and think again with a fresh mind in the morning. Instead, when they entered the restaurant later around 7 a.m. that morning, she was beaten again so badly she didn't survive. Kwandik and Sultanat are first shown entering the Bao restaurant just before 9.15 on November 8th. They are next seen walking outside, 45 minutes past midnight. It's clear they are having a disagreement. Kwandik reaches out with an overcoat to Sultanat, which she eventually refuses to take and walks away, but later puts it on. After a short chat, they both return inside. Returning inside, you can really notice the difference in body language. Sultanat is on her phone. Around the time she spoke to her brother, Kwandik immediately peeks over to take a look, and you can see from her body language she's frustrated by this. It's 1 a.m. now, and their disagreement continues. She stands in the corner, he starts smoking. They continue to talk to each other. According to Kwandik's testimony, he was trying to calm her down because she said she wanted to leave him. He said things like, relax, sleep now, think it over in the morning with a fresh mind. They continue talking while guests are entering and leaving. It's clear from their hand gestures, this isn't a friendly discussion, but a disagreement over personal matters. At the trial, Kwandik's defense team are pointing out how she's so intoxicated she can barely stand up herself for one minute. But the prosecution side interjects, stating the defense team are not experts in body language and not to draw any incorrect conclusions. They also remind everyone that only faint traces of alcohol were found in her system. What is clear from the footage is how Kwandike stands right in front of her, places his hand on her head and face, while she's backed out against the wall. She doesn't touch him back. He continues to display control over her, physically moving her face with his hands whilst she talks and looks away. Clearly, he's exhibiting dominating behavior over his wife. At one point, he holds her head in both hands and talks to her right up to her face. She has no personal space, cannot look away, and he's staring her right in the eyes. It's often a hallmark of abusers to try and control the situation in every way possible. This goes on for over 20 minutes as they continue their disagreement. In court, Kwandike says he's trying to reason with her, to tell her to think it over after getting some sleep in the morning. But Sultanat is looking away from him, not displaying any interest. She seems to be wrestling with her thoughts, possibly wanting to leave, but is cornered by his psychological and physical grip over her. One thing to note, that being out in public, they're still maintaining a demeanor which wouldn't bring too much attention to them. This will all change later that night, when they enter the restaurant together, the third and final time. By around 1.15 a.m., the disagreement continues and doesn't seem to show any signs of improvement. Around 2.30 a.m., they enter the restaurant and she walks into the VIP room, while Kwandike heads over to the bar to grab glasses and alcohol. They emerge just before 7 a.m. This time, both Kwandike and Sultanat are wearing fewer clothes. She appears to just be wearing a long jacket, and her husband no longer has a shirt under his. They both head outside. While outside, this entire time she seems to be giving him the cold shoulder while he's talking and trying to convince her of something. They return back in around 7.16 a.m. She goes in first, but doesn't open the door for him. His hand gets stuck between the door and his cell phone falls. After he picks it up, he follows her inside, where the fatal incident took place, and she never made it out alive. Once inside, within seconds he grabs her head with both hands and violently shakes it and pushes her back. She looks terrified as she falls down to the floor. As she lay in the fetal position and clutching her head, he kicks her three times, the last one with such force he's seen lifting his foot as far back as he can. Each time he kicks her in the thighs and buttocks, it looks painful. As she lay there, withering in pain, he walks away then returns and shockingly pulls her up by the head with one hand. Despite being dazed, she manages to stand, 
leaning on the half-sized cabinet behind her. In a moment, he smacks her hard, swinging his left arm for added force. The blow sends her head recoiling back, causing her to hit the wall behind her and slump down into the cabinet. Now gripping her head, undoubtedly in pain. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, Bishambayev grips her throat with his left hand. Pushing her back against the wall, he strangles her with his bare hands while she continues to appear dazed and defenseless. He then delivers a hard smack with his right hand and momentarily she walks away. She slumps over to the other side, but somehow manages to stand off her feet. Perhaps her instincts to stay alive were kicking in as she tries to walk away from him, but he approaches her again. This time, he viciously grabs her by the hair and pulls her towards him. Unable to keep up, she falls to the ground. Routinely, he stops and goes back to pull her up by the hair, eventually dragging her into the adjacent toilet at 7.18 a.m. They emerge a minute and a half later, with him once again pulling her by the hair as she struggles to stay upright. One can only imagine her pain and terror as she is unable to defend herself as this monster drags her into the VIP room, a place from which she never emerged alive. Who knows what horrors she continued to face inside, as the beating we saw on camera was likely just the tip of the iceberg. In court, Bishampayev denies all guilt for causing his wife's death. Instead, he said that she, under the influence of alcohol, made false claims, insulted and provoked him. During their argument, she attacked him and he pushed her back, slapping her four times with his open palms so as not to hurt her, and then carefully kicking her in her thighs and buttocks so as not to hurt her. This man seemed completely delusional considering what we saw on CCTV showed she never laid a finger on him. And even if the claims of provoking him were true, so what? Is his finicky ego so pathetic that he must resort to physical violence? Because even as a seasoned politician, he cannot respond back with words. He further claimed that all fatal injuries on her head and face she inflicted upon herself. She was arguing with him and was taking off the jewelry and clothes that he so lovingly gave her, but she lost her balance and hit her head on the toilet. When she tried to get up, she fell again and hit her head on the tiled floor. He claimed to escort his wife to the VIP booth, you know, by dragging her by the hair, after which he gently put her to sleep on the sofa and fell asleep besides her. This laughable testimony was later rejected by the jury and the forensic expert on trial explicitly stated the injuries on her head and face could not have resulted from a fall. Perhaps a car accident would have been a more plausible explanation, but likely no person could trip, fall, and injure themselves in the manner that led to her death. It also didn't explain the marks of strangulation, which were strong enough to show up in post-mortem examination. Just before 10 a.m., less than three hours before Kwandaik drags Salanat by the hair into the VIP booth, we see his cousin, Bakhtazan entering the restaurant. He heads straight to the VIP booth, walks out, grabs a blanket and comes back. This is what they wrap Salanat's naked body in. Around 1 p.m., he tells the restaurant staff to leave. This is also around the time he went to delete the CCTV footage within and outside the restaurant and turn off the cameras. Luckily, digital forensics team were able to recover the footage that we saw, and this was shown at the very public trial of Kwandaik and Bakhtizan Baizanov. From sources, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, was supposed to visit on that very day, and there was heightened security in the area preparing for his visit. Obviously, this reservation had to be cancelled. To cover his tracks, Kwandek Bishambayev secured the help of his cousin, Paktizan, to not just delete the CCTV footage and ask the staff to leave, but to take Sultanat's cell phone around the city, giving GPS pings for locations to show she is alive and well. He took her phone to a fitness center, then turned on airplane mode, and then brought it to their home. 
This gave her brother Aitbek, who Sultanat shares her GPS location with, false hope that despite her not coming over to his home that night, she is okay and she must have simply been sleeping and got up and gone about her business the next day. Aitbek's account. After receiving her text at 12.40 a.m. on November 8th, where she said she was getting a taxi and coming over, her brother noticed her upset tone in her messages and assured her he was at his place and asked her to come over. He checked her phone's location and found out she was at the gastro center where the restaurant is located. At 1.04, he texted her back, asking when she'll arrive. At 2.05, she read the message and made a quick call, but dropped it before her brother could answer. He called her back, but there was no answer. This time it showed she was at the adjacent Talent Towers building. This is where the Ritz Carlton is, and her brother assumed she was staying there overnight. This coincides with the CCTV footage where Sultana and Kandike were walking outside. At 7.46 a.m., he texted her back. Her phone was still showing at Talent Towers, so he assumed she was sleeping. The message was marked red around lunchtime and he assumed she woke up and checked out. However, that evening, her friend, Linara, called him and mentioned the police had arrested her husband on suspicion of killing her. This news turned his world upside down. He checked the GPS and found it was pinging at Sultana's home. He immediately drove there, but no one answered the door and the lights were off. He then rushed to the restaurant where she had first texted him from and he discovered the terrible truth. He called his father to confirm the news. However, the call was on speaker, and his mother overheard their conversation. She screamed upon hearing of her daughter's death. The trial of Kwandik Pishampayev was broadcasted on YouTube, began in Astana on March 11, 2024. Pishampayev insisted upon a public trial himself, believing the country would sympathize with his side of the events. But clearly, being raised in a life of luxury, he instead displayed how out of touch he was with Kazakh society. He aimed to appeal to conservative societal norms, emphasizing his wife's alleged inappropriate behavior and addiction. However, this backfired as a hypocrisy of his defense team's actions to slander her character when the CCTV camera showed him as the only aggressor, and the history of their marriage led to her losing not just her friends, career, but also her life, in such a short time, it garnered him no sympathy from the majority of the people. People publicly protested, with women and men holding wine glasses when news spread of how his defense team tried to slander her because she drank. The moral double standards for women were widely rejected by the Kazakh society today. The deceptive behavior of both Bishimbayev and his cousin Bizanov didn't sit well with the judge or jury. Quantik Bishimbayev was found guilty of torture and murder. He was sentenced to seven years in prison for torture and 20 years for murder. The sentences were partially combined, resulting in a total of 24 years in prison. Additionally, Bakhtizan Bezanov, the director of Gastro Center, was found guilty of knowingly hiding a serious crime. He was sentenced to four years in a medium security prison with credit given for time already served. The tragic death of Sultana Nikonova caused a firestorm of public outcry for significant legal reform for more severe criminal penalties in Kazakhstan. Sultanat's law was pushed through the justice system and will come into effect in June 2024. It criminalizes all domestic abuse and the police must investigate all such cases. Sultanat Nikonova, may you rest in peace and your death will not be in vain. Share your thoughts in the comments below. Also, check out some of my other cases on screen. This is Victor. Thanks for watching.